Hi everyone, in this video <clears throat> I'm going to be walking through activity 1-5 titled Testing a Boot Image. This is from the MCSE slash MCSA guide to Microsoft Windows Server 2012 administration in preparation of exam 70-411. In my edition of the book, this activity begins at the bottom of page 24. Um, a quick little background about the activity. Um, we've built up a server to act as a domain controller, so we have um, Active Directory, Domain Services, um, Users and Computers, um, that whole kit installed as a role on the server. Um, we've also added DNS, um, Group Policy Management, and DHCP. Um, so we have all of those set up and configured. And then we came and installed the WDS, the Windows Deployment Services. And we did a basic configuration here. We don't actually have any images to install yet. This activity is just testing to make sure that our configuration is set up properly so that once we have an image, we'll be able to push it across the network to um, other computers in order to install an operating system to them. Um, so in the configuration, I went ahead and installed the WDS services to the C drive, um, which also houses the operating system for the server. In a test environment, that's fine for some practice. In a real live environment, you would want to have this on a separate drive altogether, if at all possible. Um, and if that's not possible, at the very least on a separate partition than the operating system for the server. Um, I believe the main reason for that is um, for performance more than anything. It's not likely to screw up anything on the operating system side of the server, but the server will be limited to how quickly it can read and read data and transmit it across the network if it's housed on the same partition or the same drive as the operating system itself. So having a secondary drive for your WDS is definitely recommended. Um, beyond that, I'm going to go into a quick couple of notes. Um, since I'm doing this whole course in VMware. Um, all my systems are virtual. I needed to go ahead and build a blank machine to test WDS. And so I have my blank machine here. It has no operating system. It literally just has hardware at this point. Um, and in VMware it's a little bit tricky getting in and looking at the boot at the BIOS or checking the boot options or selecting different boot options. Um, since it doesn't have an operating system installed yet, I believe that it eventually would get down to the network boot and process correctly. I don't really want to test that if I don't have to, so I came in um, wherever you stored the hard drives for this machine. Come and find this VMX file. <coughs> and you can edit this um, either in Notepad++ or just use a basic Notepad if that's all you have. Some kind of text editor and add this line right here, the BIOS.bootDelay. Um, this will hold that machine at the BIOS selection, um, kind of when you first see it boot, where it's booting the BIOS before it tries to boot an operating system. Um, this time is in milliseconds, so 1,000 milliseconds is one second. I believe the maximum value is 10,000 milliseconds, or 10 seconds. So I've set it to that here. Um, so literally all you need to do is come into this text file, add this line and save it, and then close the text editor. And that should allow us to power this machine on and have about 10 seconds to select the network boot, just to make sure that it actually sees that it has a NIC card and that it can boot to the network and all that. Okay, so we have kind of the basic setup ready for everything. And we just want to take a quick look here inside of our WDS server. Um, in one of the previous activities, it may have been 1-4, we came and created this install WIM. Um, if you have the disk itself, you can go ahead and toss it into the drive, the CD or DVD drive for the server. And let's go take a quick look inside of the data on that disk. We want to navigate into the sources folder and there's two key files for WDS that we want to find. One is bootwim and the other 
is the install WIM right there. So when you come in to create a new boot image, it's going to ask you to go and find the source folder for those files. Um, so since my machine is virtual, I've mounted an ISO of that data disk um, and browsed down into the sources folder. And so we can see both of those files. Um, I already created one, so I'm not going to add another one here. But that's the quick and easy way to get it through the wizard it'll kind of just walk you through a couple of steps to create this. Once it's created, it's actually no longer on the disk. The server is reading from itself, um, from inside of the remote install. And I believe it falls under the boot images, um, x64, English, US, or images. No, nope, images, there it is. So now that that is actually there, we could eject the CD, we could unmount the ISO, um, whatever you need to do. I don't see any reason to remove it at this point, so I'm just going to leave it. Um, back here in our remote install folder, back one more, we do have this images folder. Um, once you create custom images, they'll be saved here. And so the custom image will not only be an operating system, um, like Windows 7, 8, or 10, It'll also include any custom software that you have um, for your company or a corporation, whatever environment you're working in. This can include antivirus, um, document editors, photo editors, video editors, um, video players, um, anything like that. And it'll combine all of it into one package so that when you install over the network, the machines that receive that image will have all of that um, data. So we'll have all the programs, any updates that you've included. Um, the only thing that you really need to worry about at that point is keeping this image up to date um, with Windows updates or your custom software updates and antivirus updates. And you see where I'm going with that. And then part of the process for creating this image is to sysprep it. So once you have it installed, you'll need to do a little bit of hands-on with those machines just to make sure that they get the appropriate licenses um, for the operating system and for any other Microsoft products that require licenses that you're using. I've noticed that SysPrep will go and strip out pretty much all the Microsoft licensing. It'll also remove any user profiles and stuff like that, so it's like a clean install. Um, if you have custom software, it'll usually leave those licenses intact. Um, so here's where those would be housed. Um, you see that we haven't created anything yet, so we won't actually be able to install anything over the network. This activity is just to test to make sure that our configurations are set up correctly, so that once we do have an install image created, we'll be able to install it out across the network. Um, I th think that covers a lot of the background. I guess that wasn't quite as brief as I had anticipated. Um, but the activity now is literally just to power on this machine, and get it going through the process of booting over the network. And so you see we have a countdown there in the bottom right. Um, you can go F2 to BIOS, F12 to network. We're going to go to the network. And we should see that it connects, and we hit F12 to initialize the network boot. Um, that IP address is the server. It's the static IP address for the server that, ha that holds the WDS services. And that is now pulling, downloading the boot.wim in order to prep the system to install a Windows operating system. This should only take a few seconds and then we'll see it actually begin the setup process, which unfortunately we won't be able to complete it because we don't have that, that actual install yet. Um, but this verifies that at the very least our configurations and our network are working correctly to allow us to do this. Almost there. All right. And so one of the first things it should do, if not the first thing, is it should prompt us for a locale or a language and a keyboard type. So hopefully we will see that pop up here. And then one of the 
other things that we'll need to do is verify our domain credentials so that this machine can actually pull data across from this domain server. Um, Alright, so here we see that WDS is working. Um, we're going to leave it English US because that applies here. And there's the prompt for our domain credentials. So we have the domain backslash administrator. Um, again, in a test environment, this is fine. It'll get us where we're going. In a live environment, you may want different accounts for different roles for your users. So you may want to have a user that is specifically for um, WDS installations across the network. You might want to have a separate user that just manages DNS, a separate, manage, uh, separate user that manages DHCP. Um, so you can kind of set up user accounts that are limited to specific focus areas um, so that way they can only do certain things without affecting the other things that maybe they're not trained on or not experienced with. Um, that really depends on how big your environment is and how, whether or not you can really specialize users that way. Um, in smaller environments you may not have six different administrative users for specific things like that. You may have two or three that kind of have to be able to do a little bit of everything. So there will be a little bit more generic administrators. In any case, for the test environment, we're going to go ahead with the domain admin. And we can see that we don't have any images available to install. Um, so I think the next activity is actually to create an install image here. Um, but at the very least, with this activity, we can view that WDS is working correctly and capable of pushing out these images over our network. And that really is the focal point for this activity. Um, looks like that kind of wraps everything up. Um, as always, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please feel free to leave them for me below. And I will try to reply to them in a timely fashion. Um, thanks for watching, and hopefully I'll see you in my next video.